Hello students, this is Fazan Mirza. We are right now going through the review of transport across the membrane. You know your membrane, it's a cell membrane, is a phospholipid bilayer with several proteins embedded in it. So how transport occurs across the membrane? So there are processes which include simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport, mainly in osmosis, cells, which basically hampers with water. What simple diffusion? Whenever the term diffusion comes, it basically is the movement of molecules down the gradient from a high concentration to low concentration. Simple diffusion involves small molecules, for example, carbon dioxide, oxygen, water, which moves water, which specifically can move by osmosis, but carbon dioxide and oxygen can move by simple diffusion. Lipid soluble substances, which can dissolve in the phospholipid bilayer, can also pass through the phospholipid tails. They are non-polar, so they all move by simple diffusion. But facet diffusion is a process which actually is a diffusion down the gradient occurring through transport protein with the transport protein could either be a carrier protein or a channel protein. This is primarily required for small polar substances, for example, sodium ion, potassium ion, glucose. Active transport is a movement of substances against the concentration gradient and it uses energy from the ATP breakdown and uses transport protein, which will be a carrier protein and not a channel protein. Factors that affect the rate of diffusion, rate of diffusion is proportional to the concentration gradient, temperature, surface area available, number of transport protein, and it will be inversely proportional to the density, the mass of substance, and the size of the substance as well. This diagram here shows to you figure 4.2 that how oxygen molecule can diffuse through the bilayer from between the phosphorus molecules because it's a very tiny structure. Same goes for water and carbon dioxide as well and lipid soluble substances as well. Phosphorus bilayer does not pose any uh, permeability barrier for them. But for structures, for example, as polar as glucose or amino acids or sodium ion or potassium ion, they need a channel protein or a carrier protein. So the channel protein is having a watery pathway through which the water through which this glucose molecule will enter. The pore will be lined by certain amino acids who will have R groups, and these R groups will be forming temporary bonds with the uh, with the substance that's moving. For example, here it's moving glucose. So the channels are very specific. Each substance will have its own transport channel through which it will be moving, either a channel protein or a carrier protein. If it's moving down the gradient, that basically is called as a facilitated diffusion. So if you summarize, the movement of substance across the membrane could either be by diffusion, osmosis, active transport. Osmosis deals with water moving down the water potential gradient. Diffusion can be either simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion could be either through the channel protein or a carrier protein, whereas active transport is against the concentration gradient will always be through the carrier protein. Carrier proteins, which we, are, which we are yet to discuss, work by a mechanism called as the ping pong mechanism, where the shape change and the conformational changes in the world. Figure 4.9 and 4.17 represent facet diffusion and active transport. And you can see carrier proteins working here. Carrier protein is not having a channel running throughout its length. Although it will be a transmembrane protein spanning the whole width of the bilayer, the carrier protein can change its shape. It will receive the molecule or the substance or the polar thing that it's moving from one side to the other side. Once it accepts it, it will undergo a transition and it will change its shape and release the substance in the opposite direction. The state in which it initially was the resting state, that's called as the ping state, which in, when it releases the substance, that's called as the pong state. So it moves from ping to pong state and back to ping state. In this way, it moves the substance from outside to the inside or inside to outside, depending whether it's facet diffusion or active transport and in which direction the substance needs to move. For example, if it's facet diffusion, the molecule moving by the carrier transport following the ping pong mechanism will move down the concentration gradient. But if it's active transport, then the same ping pong mechanism will be occurring against the concentration gradient and ATP energy, which is coming from the breakdown of the ATP will be required there. And for that, aerobic respiration is mandatory because if aerobic respiration is going on, only then enough ATP will be available to have this process of active transport continue because it needs breakdown of ATP and ATP is regenerated by the process of aerobic respiration. Just like channel proteins, carrier proteins are also equally selective. Here we are discussing the, uh, the example of sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump is an example of the most commonly studied example of active transport. This pump is the most important pump present in the living organisms, be it any cell and our cells, the, the human being cells. Each and every cell is having the sodium potassium pump. The phospholipid bilayer is shown to you. The sodium potassium pump, you can see there's no pore in it. This uh, transmembrane protein. Why it's called a pump? Because it moves the substance against the gradient. It's also called a sodium potassium pump or sodium potassium ATPase. Wherever the term ATPase is used, it means it's having an enzyme that can make ATP into ADP and PI and releases energy. Now, 
The way the sodium potassium pump works is that it's present in the membrane in such a way that outside of the sodium potassium pump is having two binding sites for potassium ions. So two slots for potassium ions on the extracellular side, so the outside of the cell. So the two potassium ions sits there, they occupy these slots, and inside toward the, the, side, the face of the sodium potassium pump facing the cytoplasm is having three slots for sodium ions to fit in. So three sodium ions, one, two, and three eventually sit into their slots. And then there is an enzyme ATPase that undergoes, uh, that carries out the breakdown of ATP and converts it into ADP and PI. And when this ATP is broken down and three sodiums have already attached at the inner surface and two potassiums have already occupied the outer surface, this protein undergoes a conformational change, a change of shape. It flips, it rotates, it just moves the three sodiums outside, they go out and the pot two potassiums are released in. And again, this is ping pong mechanism. So once this two, two potassiums have been moved in, the three sodiums have been moved out and ATP has been broken down, sodium potassium pump reverts into initial ping state in which again, the potassium binding sites are exposed on the outer side and the sodium binding sites are inside. So once again, three sodium will bind to the inner surface and two potassium will bind to the outer surface. ATP will be broken down and same way two potassium will enter and three sodium ion will leave as conformational change occurs. So you can see that two, three ions are cations which are moving all having the same positive charge and two ions which are moving in are also positive charges. So three positive charges go and two positive charges come inside the cell. This creates a relatively negative environment inside the cell. So that actually means outside the cell, there are more positive ions. Inside the cell, there is less negative ion. And this is called as the resting membrane potential, something that you study in further classes when you go to a higher level or when you go to A2. That's it for now.